So at any rate, we designed instruments to go down into boreholes that might go back uh, hundreds of thousands of years in time and have a laser down, as we lowered this instrument down into the borehole, the laser would swing around and send pulses out and occasionally it would hit a mineral grain and some fraction of the time the information would come back that there's something dark there. So if you look all the way down thousands of meters at the returned number of photons from the laser, you find all of the record beautifully preserved of climate. Glacial periods, there was a lot of uh, uh, desert exposed because the ocean water was frozen fairly far down. So you've got climate, you've got volcanism, and then I was thinking about this and I said, how about microbes? So that's the story today. Uh, well, it, you know, I should have done it beforehand. All right. Well, so this, for those of you who heard Steve Klein's talk, uh, this is the description of the so-called ice cube neutrino observatory. It's called a cube because it is a cube, but it starts about one mile down and continues. I'll, I'm going to stop using uh, met, uh, uh, English units and just talk about metric units because that's what the, the language of science really is, thanks to Napoleon. So from one and a half kilometers to two and a half kilometers down, we get, go below the, the region that has bubbles in it, and there are bad regions where there were a, a glacial maximum, uh, and we don't like to put phototubes there. Phototubes are these big tubes that uh, collect light. They're pointing downward because we're going to use the entire Earth uh, to screen out everything except neutrinos. I think that's about all I'm going to say, uh, uh, except I, I tried to give you a little bit of justification for uh, how I got interested in looking for life in ice. So here's the uh, power plant. On the left, the five megawatt heating uh, tanks. You take snow and melt it, and then it goes up almost to the boiling point, and then you go up to where one of the towers is that uh, lowers this uh, jet all the way down, and in about 10 hours, even though the temperature is minus 55 at the South Pole ice, uh, you can make it all the way down to 2,400 meters in about half a day uh, with that much power. Uh, so now you, what you've got is the uh, warm water. Uh, and then people like me come along and put all our gizmos down into it to measure what's happening in the ice, and then we get out of there. Okay, well, just I should just show this one. Uh, neutrinos coming up through the Earth. They're in three flavors. There's the electron-type neutrino, and that's on the left what it happened. You don't see the neutrino itself, uh, and only a fraction of them interact. And I often get the question, how does the neutrino know that it has to interact after going through virtually the entire Earth, and then suddenly, when it gets conveniently close to the ice cube phototubes, it turns into something that you can see. And in the case of the electron neutrino, it's uh, one electron which may multiply tremendously, but it doesn't go very far in a straight line. So what you get for the electron neutrino signature is a great blob of illuminated phototubes inside the ice cube, and you add up all of the energy in those phototubes, and you have what we call a, uh, well, it calorimeter. You measure the amount of energy in the neutrino. In the middle one, what we call the muon neutrino, emits a muon when the uh, neutrino interacts, and it travels in a straight line, and you don't get a very good indication of energy, but you can go back to the other parts of the universe and see, oh, that may have come from this particular galaxy that just blew up. And the third type isn't shown up there. That's called the tau neutrino. All right, so now we go to uh, my interest. Uh, this involves, because I'm, I'm sort of uh, interested in a lot of different topics, uh, we will talk about physics, chemistry, biology, uh, earth sciences, and astronomy. And here, I'm going to talk about ice cores, which are kept, there's 25,000 meters of ice cores stored in Denver at the National Ice Core Lab. 
and you have to get dressed suitably. It's minus 35 in the storage room, that's 35 Celsius, which is roughly the same in Fahrenheit. And then they bring them out for work, and the temperature is a balmy minus 25. And then you have to work in the dark at minus 25 uh, to use this instrument, which is called, a, we call it the Berkeley fluorescent, what do I say up there, BFS? The Berkeley fluorescent spectrometer. This is one of a series of such instruments that uh, uh, we have designed. And let me see, I've got a pointer. I even brought my own. So there's the ice. Uh, it moves at about the full one meter in two minutes. And during that time, this laser, which is pointing down into the ice, produces fluorescence. That's a radiation which is shifted to longer wavelengths, uh, a different color, but it can be characteristic. And most of the time, I will be talking about microbes that uh, have chlorophyll in their bodies. And I'll, I'll tell you much more about that in a minute. So we can look at, the, the, we have these collectors that have different filters that look at different parts of the spectrum. So chlorophyll is our favorite. Then you have tryptophan amino acids, which uh, are characteristic of life in general. Uh, then we can say something about volcanoes, and that's about it. Um, now, um, okay, so I need to tell you a couple of things, a little more about fluorescence uh, radiation, and a little bit about the remarkably small size of microbes. And the scientists use the term micrometer or micron. I'll show you how big a micron is in just a moment. Okay, so the since most of my talk is about uh, organisms that have chlorophyll, uh, there are these two, Prochlorococcus and Synecococcus, that are not as old as the very uh, oldest organisms on Earth. Those were the methanogens uh, that only breathed. CO2, uh, certainly the, the air was a poison to them and there was no air, on, there was no oxygen in the air back when we, uh, about four billion years ago when the methanogens arose. And uh, almost two billion years later, fortunately for us, uh, oxygen producing organisms uh, evolved. So the, the simplest equation for how we get oxygen from these critters is CO2 from the atmosphere plus water plus energy from the sun goes to some carbon mineral, which uh, carbon compound, which is a great benefit to most of the other microbes that are found in the ocean. So these two genera provide that uh, raw material for them to uh, evolve. And here's the oxygen in the equation. About half of the air that you and I breathe comes from the production of air, of oxygen, from these two species in the ocean. The oceans are full of fortunately. Uh, and then the, the, the product is energy. So here's just an example of a postdoc that we had who uh, built one of our earlier uh, spectrometers and put it down into the boreholes. And so you start with a, a long wavelength light and without any attempt to use what the biologists typically use, which is a stain that fluoresces when you strike the right uh, uh, light, light of the right wavelength. Without any staining, um, there are ways of imaging. If you choose the right wavelength of incoming light, Bacillus subtilis, that's one of the most common uh, genera that we know of, the cyanobacterium, uh, produce the red if you use blue light to eliminate them. And I have to keep remembering. How, oh, no. I got to walk all the way over here. Okay. On the left is uh, the business end of a, a pen, which is used by dressmakers, by you and me. And there's some little white things on it. What do you think the little white things might be? Bacteria. 
they're about mi a micron. So that sets the scale for how big one micron is. Now, let me go down below that scale, just for completeness, and talk about viruses, which are also quite ancient in origin. And they're something like a tenth to a hundredth, uh, the size of one of these uh, bacteria. And um, we all think of them as being bad for you. They're even worse for bacteria. So here's one micron-sized bacteria that's full of little black blobs. And those black blobs were the result of viruses, let's say this virus, which has one gene that makes this interesting crystallographic shape. And in some cases, the smallest viruses only have one other gene, which is to eat, or to, or to I guess, to amplify their DNA. Their DNA. But they extract uh, energy from the bacteria that they, here's one sitting on the surface. And it, so it sends its DNA down into the cell and replicates, and finally the cell bursts. And they go back, and uh, this one is in the ocean. So then uh, the viruses go back into the ocean. The trick for me is to try to figure out what's the probability that one virus will capture the only species of cell that it can possibly do this to. It's a sort of a, a lock and key mechanism. So there's one vir virus specific to every genus in the ocean. All right, now we get to the substance of my talk. Uh, ice is what we call polycrystalline. It has many different crystals that can be distinguished from each other by using a crossed Polaroid, uh, plastic Polaroid, and sending light through it. And uh, because they have a, uh, a symmetry axis in their structure that varies when you put them all together. It points in different directions. And the light that you see between the cross nickels um, has a, a specific color. And so we're going to zoom in on one, this black one. And uh, so here's uh, a simplified cartoon of that one ice crystal. And the thing that brought me to the attention of biologists, which was a paper in 2000, 2000, so that's a long time ago, was using the various tools, physics, chemistry, uh, and Gabor Somerjai, Professor Somerjai knows about eutectics, because they teach that in freshman chemistry. Uh, eutectics um, are known, in, not by that name, but in Schenectady, New York, where my wife and I lived for many years, uh, you have icy sidewalks. And the ice um, can slip on unless you pour salt on it. If you pour salt from your kitchen, <clears throat> uh, it, is, it has a, a eutectic effect. Salt melts the ice uh, down to about minus 21. So if, it, if the temperature is above minus 21 Celsius, uh, the salt works. In the case of ice at the South Pole, the major compound that's um, present it's a, as an impurity, and it's only a few parts per million, is sulfuric acid, which is bad for you. But it helps the microbes to stay alive in something that's close to pure liquid water. What, they, what happens is, as the snow falls and gets compacted, <clears throat> it eventually becomes really dense ice, but most impurities that are present in the snow, like sulfuric acid, are insoluble in those ice grains. And they get rejected, and they stay outside of the ice. And where three grains come together, you have a line. Where two grains meet, of course, you have a plane. Three grains make a line. Four grains have a, a corner. And all of that sulfuric acid and the other in, uh, impurities that were in the snow get rejected into these little racetracks that are about two or three or four microns in diameter. Just enough for bacteria to get pushed into where most of them die because they can't stand high sulfuric acid. But a fraction of them live for thousands of years at very low temperature, not getting enough energy to move, but being able to convert some of the sulfuric acid to products that provide them with food and carbon. 
Uh, the carbon is only used to replace dead parts of the body. Uh, the metabolic energy that they have <clears throat> is about a million times lower than the metabolic energy for a bacterium in the ocean to grow. That means to divide its cells. So they are really stuck there, and we'll come back to them off and on during the talk. Now the scenario, or rather the locations, well, I guess I should say, how did I, how did I prove that? Well, in a cold room, uh, biologists have slicers, microtomes, that can make millimeter, half millimeter, or thinner sections. As long as you keep the temperature low enough, you can put them on a microscope and look through the ice. And this is what you see. This is at one of those corners. That is going along one of the veins, that along another, and that along another. So that was enough proof for biologists who like to see things visually before they will believe a physicist. Uh, now this, is, this shows where we've gotten drill cores. Of course, we got them by not going there, but by going to the National Ice Core Laboratory with money. Uh, so two places in Greenland. This, the highest point of Greenland runs along there, and uh, it's about 3,000 meters, two miles, to bedrock. And so the cores go all the way down to bedrock. Then over here, we've done uh, studies of ice cores. Here's the South Pole. Here's the place that I'm dying to form a collaboration with uh, European scientists to work there because they have dated ice that goes back bottom to 800,000 years, and that's the record so far. Bostock, I'm going to come back to. If you look at this slightly lighter color, that seen by a satellite is a slightly flattened region of ice that forms an impression of Lake Vostok, which we will come back to in the very last slide. Maybe a few of you saw in the news that Russians, after many years, managed to develop a sufficiently uh, antiseptic way of drilling that last few meters to get into the lake water. Now, uh, I'm going to show. I'm going to give you first of all a suggestive argument that I thought we might have Prochlorococcus and Synecococcus inside of those ice cores, and here are the records of our. Uh, Berkeley fluorescence spectrometer, spectrometer going. I'm just taking a few examples, but this is the West Antarctic ice sheet divide. Uh, the ice core goes here from 83.4 meters to 84.4 meters. So this is one meter. And you look at the little uh, ups and downs. So every one of these little data points with its error bar is uh, 1.4 millimeters long. Uh, so the spikes or my eyeball estimate of where the maxima are, uh, and then tryptophan down here, this is chlorophyll up here. Why would we have an up and a down on, a, on an annual basis? Something is warmer and something is colder. If you come over here and look at the satellite outputs from um, a, uh, a, a chlorophyll-developed uh, uh, probe, in a satellite. In the Antarctic summertime, which is in January, you have a peak in the chlorophyll, which is completely in agreement with this. Uh, and the satellite people assume that that means life. That means algae, cyanobacteria, whatnot. And then down here in the opposite hemisphere, in, in the Arctic, summer is in July. And here you see the peak is halfway between the ticks, which are January's. So it makes sense that these are species that are happier in the warm ocean than they are in the cold ocean. Two reasons. One is just they can grow faster when the ocean is 10 degrees warmer. That's about the swing at uh, intermediate latitudes. And there are about 10 hours more of sun in which they can extract energy from sunlight. OK, so that's my uh, suggestion. Now we get to something fairly technical. 
uh, at the top is one case where you see the little green dots where before I knew that they were uh, Prochlorococcus and Senecococcus in the ice, I just wanted to explore. And so I stained the way the biologists do. And uh, this was a region that, of course, I selected because it had a higher than normal number of bacteria in that little uh, slice that uh, we looked at in a fluorescence microscope. So fluorescence microscope, you choose a wavelength to uh, strike the uh, surface with, and then you look with different filters at the color of what's coming out. And here, this was partial proof that, in fact, we were right, that the Prochlorococcus and Synecococcus were causing the seasonal uh, fluctuations. Uh, so I collaborated with a biologist who grew in what are called cultures, where you just grow, 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 and so you start with one cell, and you make uh, a huge number for people to do research with. So the Prochlorococcus, abbreviated pro, are the little dots which many of you will not see, being that far back, and the bigger dots, which are the Senecococcus, which have a body that's typically maybe four or five times the volume of the Prochlorococcus. And if you switch back and forth between this beautiful form of microscopy, which is very, uh, doesn't, doesn't damage the cells, um, it's called differential interference contrast, but it just gives you a nice crisp image. Then you flip to fluorescence microscopy without any staining, and what you see is all of the tiny objects have vanished. That's one reason why Prochlorococcus was not discovered in ocean uh, studies in microscopes until about 1986. They disappeared within one second. Once you use the fluorescence, uh, they, do, they do what is called bleaching, and if you wait many hours, some of the cells recover their uh, sensitivity to fluorescence. Uh, but So one second for the tiny ones, about 20 seconds for the bigger ones, and uh, there are other species that are stable. But uh, we're stuck with these two that we want to test uh, whether they're real or not. Now, this, before I really get into the, uh, the heart of the proof that we're looking at for chlorococcus and synecococcus, um, this is a trick where you develop a stain or you pay somebody else to develop it, which is called a live dead stain. And you put the cells into it, you wait a few seconds or a few minutes, and then you look uh, in fluorescence microscopy, and those that are green are supposed to be alive, and those that are red are probably dead. And the reason is that the ones that are dead don't have a nice, complete outer membrane any longer, and that particular stain that goes into them sees the DNA and gives you the red output. So now, this is the instrument that uh, most of our talk will be about. It's a flow cytometer, which uh, I just fell in love with. It's a wonderful device. And I didn't even have to learn how to use it myself. I just sat next to the guy that I was paying $50 an hour, and he did the, uh, all of the work. He had spent 14 years of his life in Hawaii working with uh, microbes from the ocean. So we got along fine. The idea is you have a, a stream of saline uh, liquid that's sterilized into which you dump um, the melted ice that you want to search for bugs in. So here's a cartoon of bugs, and they flow down one by one, and then you have as many as five lasers that when they pass one focused laser beam, you get an output. The next one, you get an output. In the same cell, you can get as many as five outputs, including how big they are. So I'll first show you some examples I've just taken out of the uh, various published papers that show what the flow cytometer can tell you about marine cells. So we'll start up here, and what we're plotting is the red output, and one dot, which you, from where you sit, you can hardly even see it, but there are a lot of red dots right there. But one cell 
is a result of the laser beams uh, detection emitting the red. Uh, and uh, we, so we, we put it into the, we store it into the memory. Here with the same cell, so let's pick one that's, I can't hold my laser beam uh, 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 still enough, but it's there. And so we know it's chlorophyll, a content, something like, uh, what, 40 units? And over here, we know it's phycoerythrin content. So we come down here, and that's about three units. And it has an orange color. So those are very characteristic of Prochlorococcus and Synecococcus. And if the value falls in this blob um, from calibrations with cultures, they identify it as Prochlorococcus. Up along this string, the green has more chlorophyll and a lot more phycoerythrin, and that's called Synecococcus. These little purple dots are beads that have been specially prepared by a manufacturer. Uh, they are typically one micron in diameter. And so that gives you a, a ballpark of whether this is of the order of a micron. It looks like it might be less. And we come over here from a totally different part of the world's oceans. Now you see the two circles here have PROC1 and PROC2. That's two different strains of Prochlorococcus. And why would one of them have a lot more chlorophyll than the other? What they realized was that the one with the more chlorophyll had decided that its, its home was going to be deeper in the ocean where there was very little sunlight that penetrated. And so it needed more chlorophyll in order to survive. And there's a similar thing here. We have two strains of Semicococcus. These uh, have more of this, well, this is, this is the side scatter. They're bigger, but they also um, live deeper in the ocean and needed to have more uh, in order to extract energy. Same with all of those other things. I won't go into the details. But those were just many examples from different parts of the world's oceans. Uh, and in other words, if you, if you collect cells, take them into the lab, use flow cytometry, you're more than likely to find that the biggest number of cells are of those two genera. So they're, they're about 10 to the 5 cells per milliliter, or size, size of a sugar cube, of water uh, at temperate latitudes. That's huge. And about the tenth that many of the Seneca caucus. How many of them might get splashed up by waves and uh, rise up into the air and winds carry them all the way from those latitudes where they're happy to the South Pole or northern Greenland. A very small number. But that's my explanation, that they have to have lived in a warm ocean in order for us to see this big change from their summer to winter in the uh, BFS, the flow cytometry uh, results. Up in the upper left, one of my collaborators, no, I've, actually I've gotten them from several collaborators, these are eukaryotes called Osteococcus, which are quite abundant, but for some reason, they don't survive being blown into the ice. I've not found them with flow cytometry. So these came from a culture. Um, the high and the low chlorophyll would correspond to loving lower depths and shallower depths in the ocean. Here are the two species that my colleague Lisa Moore uh, grew, and the ones down here the pro from the Mediterranean um, didn't need as much chlorophyll, so they were living in this, the top maybe 30, 40 meters of the Mediterranean Sea. That lived deeper. She only sent me one of the uh, Senecococcus species. And over here, paired with that, the same color scheme shows you something from their scattering. If the scattering is large, it means they're big. So here, the beads are about half a micron, which is consistent with what people think the typical size of the uh, Prochlorococcus is. The brown is the Osteococcus. Uh, let's just pick out the Senecococcus is green, so it's a bit bigger. We knew that. It's up around a micron in size. So now, now that tells us 
where we should be looking that along with uh, all of the experience of the oceanographers. Now we look for them in ice. So for a number of slides, I will show you. This one is the easiest to see uh, because I've blown it up bigger. So let's really study this. I use the same color scheme, red dots, are lying in the little band of chlorophyll and phycoerythrin uh, that the cultures showed us the Prochlorococcus should uh, fall into that band. They have about the right amount of chlorophyll and phycoerythrin. The blue, remember I showed, well up here it's in green, but um, all of these blue dots I just assigned to Senecococcus when I'm estimating concentrations. The problem is that there's not a clear demarcation between the region of red and the region of blue, and so I'm probably off by 10% or so every time I try to uh, decide what colors to use. And then over here, the reds, um, some look like they might be bigger than half a micron. Here's the blues. I won't show you these uh, beads that uh, I've bought and added to the flow stream uh, in every single case. Now we're going to just more and more. Up here was a traverse that a US and Australian team took. They walked and dug little shallow boreholes and brought them to Denver to the National Ice Core Laboratory. So um, here, the South Pole is at high elevation. It wouldn't be too surprising to find fewer cells there. And in fact, this particular little vial that we looked at at about one prochloric carrot per milliliter, one Senecococcus per milliliter, and 1.8 or something, I won't even bother to tell you. It's in fact just very, it's a spike of many, many cells that have almost no phycoerythrin, mostly chlorophyll, and yet they are prochlorococcus. So forget about that. So here's Greenland. Now this is interesting to compare two different fistfuls of ice that we melt, one from Greenland at 12 meters and one from Greenland at 12.05 meters. It's just five centimeters different, which corresponds to a few months of additional slow snow. Uh, and we see distinct differences. The red is there, it's here, the blue is here, and here, and we have a different one, different set of what I'm calling Senecococcus strain number two. It may not even be that, but look at the difference uh, between this plot and that one. And there isn't as much difference in the size plot, the side scatter there and there. So they're about the same size, but they're probably different strains. So this is going to make my uh, goal of studying evolution tricky. Oh, wait a minute. That one was correct. Uh, yes. So at the South Pole, this particular uh, fistful had more, roughly 60 prochlorococcus per milliliter, and this one had a 11 of Sevicococcus and about 189 of the low uh, phycoerythrin. And this for the specialists, the scientists, are just histograms that uh, show you that in fact, way over, this is fading I think, uh, way over at very small value of phycoerythrin, you have a lot of cells. Greenland at 2,919 meters. Um, see, it, the same pattern shows up everywhere you look. Not identical, but enough similar. We never see uh, anything way over in this part of the plot that has a lot more phycoerythrin or, phycoerythrin or way up here at the top, which has a lot of chlorophyll. Again, uh, I'm repeating the giving more examples. So the places I really would like to go, because uh, if I go to the bottom, it, the cells would be 800,000 years old, is just 103 meters. They didn't trust me at first. And so they gave me samples they were willing to destroy, or have me destroy, uh, 103 meters, 120 meters. Um, they're very similar in the locations, but this one happened to have uh, about 100 times more 
cells, and I use the centrifuge over and over to concentrate it more. Waste divide, that's the West Antarctic, uh, the NSF project, uh, at 175 meters, at 86 meters, same color scheme, red, blue, scattering over here, here, they're all about the same size. And going this way, this is the last example I think I will give, uh, the Greenland ice at 19 meters and at 3,037 meters. That's 150,000 years ago and it's just about at bedrock. Do you see any difference between this and this? I claim that uh, we must be seeing the same, uh, at least ratio of chlorophyll, uh, well, ratio and species in that part of the Arctic Ocean that are making it over time and again over 150,000 years. And this just summarizes everything. This is only 62 little experiments. Uh, the uh, Greenland is the red dots, and what, what we're plotting here is just perchlorococcus cells per milliliter. So we go up to the very most we ever see is something like 600. That's, and when you realize that their bodies are so small, that really makes it challenging to do genomics. Uh, so the blue is a different part of Greenland. This is the West Antarctic, another part of the West Antarctic, Sipel Dome, another part of the West Antarctic. And then here is East Antarctica, which has the highest location of ice. It's the hardest for the cells to make it to. And it typically has the smallest number of Prochlorococcus there, Seneccococcus here. Ratio of Prochlorococcus to Seneccococcus is between about one to one and three to one or five to one. And this is the uh, uh, grouping of cells that have the very low phycoerythrin. erythrin. And now we're getting down to my ultimate goal for the next few years of my life. Uh, and that's to try to do uh, what this famous evolutionary biologist does. He spent some time in Berkeley, married a graduate student from life sciences, I don't know whether they're still married or not, but he has been for many years uh, in first Finland where he grew up and then Leipzig. Uh, and he's going to spend his year here as a Miller professor. Uh, I've already had some correspondence with him and he says he has some tricks about how maybe to increase the sensitivity of the genomic studies so that we could even work with the small number of cells that, that we're talking about. Some of you who follow the uh, uh, what's happening in the news, will have learned that he and his team uh, found roughly 1 to 4 percent of our genes are Neanderthal. Uh, and he's staring at the skull. Now, now this is what stimulated me to do what uh, I'm proposing to do for the next several years. Uh, Richard Linsky, well-known biologist, uh, took one E. coli cell, we all know about the bad strains of E. coli flu, but they live happily in our digestive system. Uh, so he starts with one, he warms up the petri dish and its nutrient to blood temperature, and they start to divide, and he takes set, uh, 12 cells that were clones of each other, the same, puts them in 12 different petri dishes, and he's published probably 20 papers on his findings with he, him and his colleagues, studying as they grow under identical conditions, but separated from each other in different petri dishes. Uh, and the turnover time for, for uh, dividing is about 20 minutes at his temperature. So he's been able to get up to 10,000 generations, and what he does is in each of the 12 petri dishes, he looks at the average cell volume. I don't know how he did that. Um, and you define in the evolution, the word fitness means whether their genome makes them more suited to live longer or it gives them uh, bigger bodies or whatnot. So fitness here is size, and over here, some of you may have read the famous uh, articles in a journal that 
natural history, maybe it's called, where Stephen J. Gould wrote weekly columns. He's dead now. Uh, but he invented the term, uh, which is punctuated equilibrium, in which the random mutations don't seem to accomplish anything that you can observe very often, and then suddenly there'll be a change that's quite detectable. Uh, so that's just playing games with uh, drawing lines, really. Uh, you could draw a smooth curve through that just as well. This is my last slide. And this is a, a rendition of what was finally achieved by the Russians. This was their biggest and uh, most prestigious program. And they fought with uh, members of other glaciological and biological communities for many years over when they had developed a uh, technique that was safe enough that when they drilled through the last meter of ice into the ocean water, or o water, we don't know what it is, um, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't contaminate, either it wouldn't contaminate the water, and they found kerosene-loving bugs all the way up the walls of the drill section because they used kerosene as a drilling fluid, and you buy your kerosene, it's got bugs in it. Uh, at any rate, there could be a substantial number of cells that go back 24 million years. That's a rough estimate of how old that water has been isolated. Uh, so one of the same group that is, I'm trying to t titillate him into agreeing to join me in going down 800,000 years into the Dome Sea. He's the chief biologist for this project, and I hope that... Uh, he will work with me to allow me to do some of the studies in the Lake Vasta. It's an ongoing story, and it's a lot of fun. Thank you. He sent his friends. He sent his friends to do it. Yeah. 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 Yes. No, he's one of the most famous. Um, he's not easy to get along with. Uh, he um, had a competition with a government uh, organization, Francis, uh, what's his name? Who? Collins, that's it, Collins. Um, and they agreed to call it a tie. Uh, they published prematurely by a little bit, but um, each one was afraid the other would sneak out and publish first. This was the human genome, I'm sorry. And it was still incomplete, um, but the time it takes to analyze a genome is dropping rapidly as a result of technological advances and the uh, intense pressure from, uh, well, those who want to make money. Um, the, you know, the goal of $1,000 for your own genome is just about to be there um, if you really want, want to know your genome. Uh, of course, it would be interesting to know what diseases you're likely to uh, be dying of at the age of 70 or so. How about, yes? No. Uh, life can proliferate in uh, hot springs. Uh, there's one wild man um, who is famous for uh, doing dangerous things, who goes to the edge of a volcano, and it's bubbling like crazy. The water's at 100 degrees. And he leans over and fishes out living bacteria. They're, those are called hyperthermophiles uh, because they can live at such high temperature. It is just amazing. Well, there is a fundamental rule that it's not clear whether one Nobel physicist or another Nobel physicist coined the, the, the saying, but it's sort of it's been propagated down. Uh, when the laws of physics do not forbid 
something, uh, it's guaranteed to happen. No, I shouldn't say it's something, because you could say that, uh, we, no. I mean, you can't travel faster than the speed of light, for example. No, no, that, I think that's, that's another lecture, is whether, in fact, uh, neutrinos at CERN can uh, travel faster than the speed of light. We'll come to that. You've, you've been doing a lot of reading. That's good. Yeah. No, that's all you have to do. Oh. How um, By me. Uh, I mean, it's, a, it's, an, it's an interesting story. Um, you, uh, you, well, in ice, this is where, you, if they get cold enough, their metabolic rate just keeps dropping to the point, finally, where in one of those veins, they don't move. I'll tell you in a moment how, the, how we actually measure the rate. But all they can do, they cannot grow. Uh, they can't replace the uh, carbon in their cells. They simply repair the two major kinds of spontaneous damage to the cells. One is called racemization of RNA where, or uh, DNA, where instead of going this way in some little places, uh, it spontaneously, at any temperature above absolute zero, finds little regions that uh, go the other way. And if you have that happen often enough, they're dead. So um, it uses some energy to try to straighten that out. And the other is double strands of DNA breaks, double, double strand breaks. So you've got a double helix. And in one particular point, an alpha particle from decay of uranium or thorium happens to be coming from a rock which is right up against that piece of ice. Or even uh, occasionally, there'll be some uranium in ice. It goes right through both strands and breaks them. And if you don't do anything about it, that contributes toward the uh, death of the organism. But uh, using some energy, they can repair it. And we've measured, we've shown that the rates at a particular temperature are the same for uh, metabolism, and I have to explain to you how we got that, uh, that number, and for repairs. But that's a lot of activity. Uh, but it's only, it only happens once in uh, you know, many, many, many years. And it's not growth, but it's still activity. Uh, yeah, yeah. But a million times less than uh, in exponential growth. And the way we know that, the way we measure it, is we collect samples at a particular temperature that are unusual in that there has been, um, they may be thousands of years old, but climatologists uh, who measure atmospheric gases and their isotopic abundances, nitrous oxide and methane are two particular cases that are very valuable to me uh, because there are nitrifying bacteria that produce the nitrous oxide in 2O and they're methanogens who produce the methane. And what I do is go to a place where there has been a huge spike in a very short uh, change of depth. And I discover that there are methanogens, a huge spike of methanogens, just at the same depth where there's a huge spike of methane. And so I just do the calculation at that temperature for that time uh, what the rate would be. I don't uh, distinguish any. I, I divide my study into Prochlorococcus and Seneca-Coccus and everything else. <laughs> and so I, I haven't really studied that. Certainly, there are. Only. Yeah. Uh, do you have a particular interest uh, in uh, halophiles? Yes. Because they have high salt concentration, they put it underground. Yeah. Most likely you will find a halo fire. Yep. So yep. I thought uh, maybe some, they found some halo fire in ice in the, uh, in the past study. So 
Well, only if I changed my uh, treatment, you know, in order to make them visible. I don't know that there's any smoking gun for saying, aha, this particular one is a halophile. Yep. But you'd have to do the biology to uh, do the diet. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know about the um, lake uh, near the Nevada border? The lake near the Nevada border that's just loaded? Yeah. Okay. Now that lake, uh, you can scoop up zillions of little wormy creatures. They're not halophiles, but you can also find halophiles. Uh, yes. Let's see, can you talk a little louder? Yes. Oh, no, it, it certainly does not. These are only proxies. Uh, there, I'm assuming their rate of uh, growth is zero, and that if you look at the depth and the time that you find a particular cell, it's telling you, if you analyze its genome, what it was doing before it left the ocean. Uh, the oceans, you, you can't go back in time. All you can do is go down in depth. Uh, but you know, over 800,000 years, you've got continuous ejection from the ocean during that whole 800,000 years, and that's uh, a fossil record. Of ocean uh, development, yes, yes. That's a terrific suggestion. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, it, it would, it would have to be, yeah. Uh, now, I know some of my best friends are climatologists who measure gases. Uh, they tend to want to look at uh, little variations in uh, the isotopic content. Um, you know, thank you very much. I got to go check on that, but. Uh, I like the suggestion. I mean, we've, we've not tried to look at the, uh, we've spent all of this time trying to convince ourselves that what we're doing makes sense and that it can stand scrutiny when we submit a manuscript to uh, proceedings of the National Academy. Because biologists don't like a physicist to do something that they didn't do themselves. And what they do themselves is always to uh, get proof positive by using the genomic techniques. I've, I've talked with a number of genomicists, and each one of them, it seems, says, yeah, we can do it for you, but don't go down the street to that other firm, because we're better than they are. So it's, it's quite a competitive game. No, you're, you're absolutely right. At the uh, National Ice Core Lab, all of the cores, uh, we've measured it, are contaminated around the outside. And we've cut cross sections and done fluorescence scanning and found that uh, you should not use anything in the outer centimeter. And it's solid ice, so there's not much motion there, but the, the outside is contaminated. And then you, and what, what makes some contamination go down as far as a few millimeters is microscopic cracks that occurred during drilling, which allowed a few molecules of drilling fluid in. And then when you took them up, the cracks had sealed. 
So that may go down several millimeters. The worst we ever came upon was uh, ice from uh, Vostok. Uh, and we've just not even touched that. And it's been there a long time. And I think the Russians probably didn't give us the best samples. So, yeah. Okay, say it, say it again louder. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that really hasn't been done. You know, I think we're, we're pushing people to uh, get interested enough to do it at a budget that we can afford. Uh, no, that's... Um, I can't immediately think of anything. And what biologists tend to do is pick the low-lying fruit. They do things that uh, ha happen to be of interest to them without, I, I have no, paper. I've never seen any papers in the literature that systematically go, it's laborious of course, but to try to, to look as a function of climate change, which this gentleman over here was talking about, um, as a, uh, or to see changes in genomes yet. And, and I think it's just because um, it's a lot easier to work with uh, microbes in the ocean or in uh, warm uh, terrestrial environments. Uh, the record high temperature for a bacterium to live at has been the subject of intense competition. And it was thought to be 113 Celsius, just about, a bit above boiling water. And so 30 years ago, whenever the Viking lander went to Mars, they sterilized all of their equipment at 115 Celsius, maybe. And then after that, it was discovered that you can find bacteria in the ocean that can live up to 160. And then another paper, 117. And now the latest one is 121. Uh, so they've given up the idea of heat treatment as a safe sterile. Household bleach, fully concentrated, sodium hypochlorite, is very powerful. And they certainly will use that. But there are other, other methods too. Um, that it's absolutely essential. Uh, I have two or three other people to support, and if they would go off and find their own grants, uh, I could probably do a great deal, because senior postdocs, by the time you've put in um, the university's overhead uh, and benefits, it's really expensive. Yeah, I, um, I think... $50,000 more, even, uh, would enable us to do a significant amount. Uh, you know, we can, I can pay everybody, but trying to pay a firm, there's one firm in uh, Hercules, California, they're dying to have us uh, do business with them. The one that I think is best is at Bigelow Marine Laboratory in the uh, coast of Maine. And I spent a week talking with him and others. I just got back yesterday. He would love to do it. He has developed a way of uh, analyzing the genome of one cell at a time. You separate the cells. Yeah. But the, the thing is that when I, I show you that in two different depths, 12 meters and 12.05 meters, you have quite a different distribution. You know that one cell is not going to give you the whole story.